I'm unmuting everybody. Can anybody speak to me? I hear you. Yeah, I hear you too. All right, are you guys coming in? Okay, so you can hear me now. All right, we're gonna go ahead and get started. Sorry, I was having a little bit of uh, technical trouble. Um, how's everybody doing? Good. Yeah, doing good. Uh, I, I was able to get uh, most of your um, presentations uh, with, with feedback. I still have about a half dozen left. So if you're in that small group, I apologize. Uh, you're going to get your feedback either later tonight or early tomorrow. So, uh, you know, um, I, I know most of you have, have been able to get that. Anybody that wants to talk to me about their feedback, uh, you know, I'll, I'll be happy to have a conversation. But um, if it's clear, you know, uh, we're gonna talk today about what we're doing in this final week. And the theme is feedback. So it's all about trying to take what you did last week, which was prodigious. You guys made a, a whole presentation from scratch. I'm really proud of you. And so we're gonna see what we can do this week to make it better. And we have a number of different avenues for you to get feedback. Now, a lot of you, uh, already sent me notices about, you know, uh, when you're turning it in on, um, oh, I'd like to do this or I need to change this, etc. So you each have your own punch list of things you'd like to do, and you're going to have a chance to make this better. You met the first deadline. This, the whole point of having a revision of this, of having a version two, a final version, is to have the chance to go and make the changes that, that occur to you later or that occur to you when you get outside input. So you're all gonna get feedback from me. And feedback from me is not meant to be, this is a command, you have to do this. This is, it's meant to be, consider what you've done and here's an outside point of view. And you know, if, if I like what you're doing, I'm reinforcing, but if I don't like what you're doing, it doesn't mean that you're wrong, it means that you should consider that, that it's a possibility. And sometimes if I don't see what you're thinking, then that's a good clue that you maybe haven't communicated right. You know, I understand that when you don't understand the instructions, it's not your fault, it's my fault. I haven't communicated the instructions well enough. So we, as, a, as a creator, as an artist, when you have an intention, when you have a meaning that you want to go out there, if I don't get it, then you need to find a new way to try to get that intention out there. So feedback is something for you to consider. It's something for you to address or, or uh, um, deal with. It's not a command. Other people don't control your projects. Other people give you advice. And so that's what I'm trying to do here. So I don't want anybody to feel like they absolutely have to do what I'm doing or, or do what I'm asking you to do. But I, I'm absolutely wanting you to consider it. That's the most important part. It's broadening your horizons to think about, well, how are other people perceiving what I'm doing? Sometimes it may be immediately clear that when someone else says something that, oh yeah, I realized that, you know, I was only looking at it from, from one vantage point. Other times it's, it comes down to choice. So uh, you have to take each bit of feedback that you receive and think about it point by point and decide, yes, this is a change that I'd like to make or address or no, this is an interesting point of view, but I think that I'm, I'm right. So the whole point of feedback is that it's a voluntary uh, uh, reflection of what you're doing. Now, sometimes when you get feedback from a boss, a boss is a boss, it's, that's different. You know, uh, that doesn't come with options. You know, if, you, if you're beholden to the boss, you've got to do what the boss says. But if you're just simply in charge of your own work and you're asking colleagues about feedback, uh, then um, it is a helpful way to make your work better. But it is not a control on you. It's something that you're entering into voluntarily. And I want all of you to kind of wrap your minds around this. We're thinking about feedback this week and we're both giving and receiving feedback. So in addition to me, there's a mechanism we've built in so that you can get feedback from your classmates, which is that we want you to post the project that you sent to me in the 3.3 discussion board. 
Last week's discussion board remains open through this week. And if you post your project and ask other students to give you feedback, I can't guarantee that it'll happen. It's all voluntary on students' parts. But in the, uh, you know, take a penny, leave a penny fashion, if you give other people feedback, then they will give you feedback. I think that we're all colleagues here and we're all trying to make each other better. And those of us that are wanting feedback understand what its value is. It helps us to understand our own work better and get closer to what we have in our, in our intentions. So those are the three things that you have. You have your own personal punch list of things you wanna do. You have feedback that you got from me and you might have feedback from other students. And you have these things to consider and reflect on your project. And then you make a list of the changes that you wanna make. So uh, this week we're revising, we're making the final version of the, of the, uh, of the project. And uh, the, I'll, I'll get back to it again at the end, but uh, um, one of the distinctions between the first draft and the final project is that the final project has to be self-running. That uh, if you had audio that you had to click to engage or you had to click to engage slides in a PowerPoint presentation or something like this, you have now have to make it all self-running so that the audience just turns it on and watches it. They don't have to go through anything. They don't have to engage the audio. You make it all self-running. And the best way to do that is to actually export it and turn it into a movie. Therefore, there's just one click and everything flows from there. Uh, and the other thing about your uh, final uh, draft is we want you to make a changes list. So you look at what you've done in your first draft and you make decisions about what you do and do want do and don't want to change. So regardless of the feedback you've gotten from other people, when you decide to change your project and you turn it in the new version, the final version, we want you to turn that in with a, a separate list. It's like a little short text document that we call a changes list, which is the changes that you've decided to make. So if you change some audio, if you change some part of the, the, the narration, you added some slides, you know, uh, you changed the order of things, whatever it is you did, you put it in a short note and you include that. So there's two things that you're turning in. You're turning in the final version, which is the self-running file, hopefully a movie, um, and, and um, you're turning in the changes list. So that's the main thing we're doing this week. We also have an exercise in feedback. So we want to just talk about feedback in general. Uh, we have one last chapter that we're having you read. And that chapter comes from uh, Resonate. It's the last chapter, so you will have read the entire book. And that chapter deals with feedback. So hand in hand, Nancy Duarte is telling us, you know, what she feels like the value of feedback is. And I think it's all going to fit in with everything else that you're hearing this week. And then there is a, uh, a third assignment in which you all have an opportunity to give feedback. We are wanting students to give each other feedback, but that's voluntary. We can't force students to give each other student, other students feedback. But we do have an assignment in which we are showing you some uh, links to previous student films, and we want you to do a short write-up on that. And I'm gonna talk about that uh, later on. That's assignment 4.3. So, um, this is where we're at. We're finishing all of the Nancy Duarte stuff. We're finishing up our project. We're getting ready to uh, make the last changes to our presentation. So I don't want this to be the last presentation you guys ever make. I just want, you know, I want you this to be the first presentation you've made using these new principles. As you go forward, if you're in other classes, you're gonna be asked to make different kinds of presentations. And remember, we've just made a wide, um, net on what we're calling presentations. They aren't just PowerPoint files. You know, a movie is a presentation. A pitch on uh, um, GoFundMe is a, a, a presentation. Uh, a YouTube video is a presentation. So there are all kinds of instances where you're gonna be making media and persuading people of your point of view. And that's what you're here to do. And you're gonna do it better if you tell a story. Don't just string facts together, but find a way to make all of the events, all elements that you have to say, connect together in a story with media that resonates with people. And then you're going to be a successful storyteller communicator. Uh, and so I want you to just take the, the, the stuff that you've read with from Nancy Duarte along with you as you go on forward from this class. 
Another thing we've dealt with in this assignment is your brand. We haven't talked about it a lot yet in class here, but the, uh, you're gonna hear throughout your education here at Full Sail, this notion that you and your skills are a brand that goes forth in the world. That even as you might wanna work for a large company that means one thing, you yourself and your skills are a brand into itself, a personal brand. And that we can look to what corporations do in selling themselves and their skills as ways to manage how people think about us. As artists with talents to sell, with work to put out into the world, uh, you know, we have reputations. You know, the, the word brand can be synonymous with reputation. But uh, in the modern world where things live digitally and there are people who are gonna see your work and have ideas and opinions about you that you've never even met, uh, you want to try to manage your brand. You want to be able to say that the things that people say about you, that the work that people see of yours is work that you're happy for them to see, that is controlled. And so uh, in thinking about personal branding, we want to try to manage our brand. We want to be able to say that we can not necessarily control what people think, but put our best efforts out to make sure that what we put forth into the world is what people want, what we want people to know and think about us. And managing your brand uh, is, is fairly simple. There's three short rules about being transparent. And it's be honest, you know, don't claim to have skills that you don't. You know, sometimes in an interview, it's, it's very easy to, to go and meet with somebody and they'll ask, can you do such and such or do you know such and such program? And uh, it's the easiest thing in the moment to lie and think that you could go home and watch a couple of YouTube videos and learn Maya 3D or something overnight. But really that's gonna, that's gonna come up and bite you. So be honest about what your skill level is. And usually as you're going forward, uh, and you know, certainly with full sale students, we all have a long list of skills that we have put forward. And we work at our craft a lot longer, a long time before we ever go in for those interviews. So most of the things that people are gonna want us to know how to do, we've already addressed and worked on. And so uh, be honest about the things that you can do. Uh, that way it never, never comes back to bite you. Uh, once, once people catch you lying about your skills, it's very hard to undo that damage. Be unique. You're going to school with a lot of other people who are going to school in the same field. And uh, it's very nice to think that if you all graduate together, you'll all get jobs. But to some extent, once you all graduate together, you're all going to start to be competing with each other. And that doesn't mean there aren't jobs for all of you, but they won't be the same job for everybody. And one of the things you're going to discover, whatever it is you're here at Full Sail to learn, 3D animation, computer programming, audio production, you know, they all involve a thousand different skills. And you're gonna discover that one or two of those are skills that you absolutely do better than everybody else. They may not be what you thought you were going to come to earn a living on, but when you discover that you're really good at something and that you rise above, take that to heart. That's what you're unique about in terms of pitching, pitching your brand. If you're the guy that somehow can make feathers work on a 3D animation, then that's what you're gonna have a reputation for. And you may not want to do that all your life, but that's going to get you a job. That's going to get you in the door and maybe even help you to do something else if that's what you're looking to do. But the things that you're the best at, make sure you push that to the fore. That's part of selling your brand is making sure that people understand what your value is. And if you're really good at one thing, then push that above all else. And finally, don't compromise. When you go out into the working world, it's very easy to uh, you know, um, do anything to get that first job. And uh, sometimes you undercut your price or you agree to do things you shouldn't or you take on jobs that you shouldn't. And it's hard to say no, but it's very important, especially as you're first getting started because the things that you do accrue to you, they stick to you. 
If you take on a job that you can't handle and you fail miserably, then that failure will follow you around unless you've made good on it. So um, saying no in the early point of your career is very, very tough, but it's one of the important things that you need to do. And another part of thinking about your brand is looking at other companies, major companies and thinking, what do they do? And so um, if you look at major corporations, they have entire departments that are set up to just push their brand image, to push the notion of who they are. And major corporations make something that we call a brand promise, which means that if you stand for something, then that's what people come to know you for. So obviously corporations sell one product or another, you know, that's not what we mean by what you're standing for. But, uh, a corporation can start to have a particular ethic and so the best corporations sort of put out a, uh, an implicit promise to people about this is what we'll do. This is what our meaning is. And uh, you know, um, a company like Google, the brand promise is something like we're going to do everything in the world to make data, make people, make the world more uh, uh, interesting to make the world a better place. We're going to use data in ways that no one else has used data before. And therefore they want to collect data. Now, you know, people start to get a little twitchy about large corporations having too much data, but Google is a company that has offered free services to people. They give it out Gmail, they give out uh, Google tools, Docs, Google Docs, and so forth. And uh, they do this all with the promise of we will use the information and the data that we acquire from all this information to create new and interesting and better tools for the future. So uh, Google's promise has always been that the more you trust them with your information, the more they're going to make your life better. And uh, for a lot of people, that's a promise fulfilled. Some people are still skeptical. Some people are always skeptical of large corporations. But to the extent possible, uh, you know, Google has never been shy of saying they're a commercial corporation and they sell your information. So they're selling your information to advertisers and so forth. So, you know, if, if you're freaked out about the fact that you go on the internet and you look for shoes and then suddenly you start to get ads about shoes, you know, that's obviously Google's fault. They, they're tracking what you're doing. They're selling that information. But they're selling that information to, for their point of view to make your life better. Because they figure if you searched for shoes, you're interested in shoes. They, they shouldn't necessarily assume you're interested in advertising, but uh, you know, that's part of the promise that um, uh, they're putting together. That we as a corporation are going to take the information we have and we're going to use it with our partners to try to make your life simpler. And if advertising to you on a particular product or particular uh, type of service is something that uh, you know gets to you information that you need, then it is helpful. So that's what Google is making to you as a brand promise, that it wants your information, and it will use your information to create new and interesting tools for the future. So a brand promise is something that a corporation puts forth and uh, asks for your help in. And uh, for a company to make a brand promise, there are a couple of things that have to be in place. It must be credible. It must uh, come from a place of the heart or authentic faith. Google is made by a couple of geeks. Um, the, two, the two data guys from Stanford who began Harvard were very much into database searching. And so they are at their core interested in data. Uh, and they aren't just you know, pulling a switch. They are believing that this is the key to making humanity better. And so it is a, an authentic promise from Google. 
Give us your data and we will make your life better. It must have value to you. And Google has tried to show if you give them information about where you are, they'll give you accurate traffic information. They will tell you what, what the weather is going to be. They will give you the information you need to, to live your life. And so a lot of people see the benefit in having that aggregated and being able to have it at their uh, fingertips anytime they want. Most importantly, a brand promise is only good if it's kept. So here's where we have to judge Google. Do they take our information and do nefarious things with it that we don't like? Do they take our information and do things for themselves that don't uh, accrue to the common good, et cetera? And while there's starting to be a growing chorus of people who don't like the giving up of privacy, that wasn't Google's fault. We all gave our information to Google. So a lot of people are second guessing the notion that we made that compact in the first place. But having made that compact, compact, how is Google performing as a corporation? Are they using that data to make people's lives better? I think you have to say that they are. I think you have to say that in terms of uh, what they've done with, with data mining to find you know, better ways to run traffic, of, uh, better ways to organize your life, about putting things at your fingertips with the phone, about putting information to the entire world at your ready, Google has figured out how to make information uh, immediately available to such an extent that smartphones seem like magic compared to 50 years ago. And that's what Google is about it at its, at its core. So that's their brand promise. Give us your information. We will make your life more interesting. And there is, in fact, a, um, a story going on with, the, with the, the event we're swept up in right now. We're all caught at home with this coronavirus uh, epidemic. And we all don't know if we can get out in public anymore. And Apple and Google have connected together and have already done the programming on an app that uh, will service everyone. The app actually works. It's in beta. I've seen it. Uh, and it essentially tracks everyone on their own phone and creates uh, um, an anonymous version of you and your movements for the last 15 days and keeps it on your phone. Doesn't share that information keeps it on your phone, but has an identity of who you are. Now, in conjunction with healthcare, if they start doing all the testing, you, you keep hearing that, oh, we're supposed to do testing, we're not doing enough testing, et cetera. If we start doing enough testing to where anybody who needs to can find out if they have the virus, if you have this app on your phone and you have the virus, you'd simply flick a switch saying that you are a carrier and suddenly everyone else who's ever been in proximity from you from their own phones would find out if they've been close to you and been infected. And this is something that will work anonymously without interfering in people's privacy. So these are the kinds of, of brand promises that these large corporations are making. Now, this app actually may not make it to market because it requires a uh, level of trust between the government and large corporations that I don't think is going to work. Um, there is no one organization that's doing all the, all the testing for viruses right now. You know, the federal government has said they're not going to do it. So it's going to be lots of different state organizations, et cetera. And I don't know that Google and Apple are going to be able to have their one single app work with, you know, a hundred different organizations and it has to be a single place that's telling them who's infected or not. But it's an, it's an incredibly interesting example of how using data and protecting people's privacy can happen simultaneously when smart people know how to use it and are given access to it. And uh, if, we, if we move out of our period right now into you know, going back to work, it really will be in conjunction with something like this app in which we all are moving around and we're knowing who's infected and who's not. And we can in real time 
get away from the person who's carrying the virus. Uh, and that'll allow us to, to do this instead of staying at home for the next 18 months or two years or how long it's going to take to actually, you know, for the, the, the epidemic to, to get over. So brand promises are about what the company projects and how people perceive them. And you can be in that same market. You can make a brand promise to the people around you. You can say, these are the skills that I have and I promise that I will give you my best efforts and that I will maintain uh, a level of, of excellence and consistency that you should expect. And you can only do this if you have the skills to put that story out there. And that again comes back to Nancy Duarte and creative presentations. Can you tell your story to the world? Can you convince people of the truth that's in your heart? Can you speak with honesty and integrity uh, and so forth? And so if you gain these skills, no matter what you're here to study here at Full Sail, I think you can then use those skills to get along in, in, in the larger creative arts world. And that's all we're seeking to do. And we weren't seeking to make anybody a master at this. We're just introducing the tools, getting you started. You're going to have 30 months or more of chances to make new presentations. If you see presentations that your classmates made that impress you, then maybe next time around you, when you make one, you can steal some of their ideas. We're all going to help make each other better. And we're all going to do that, not just by uh, encouraging each other, but, uh, you know, getting involved, working together, stealing each other's ideas, making each other better. Um, now, there are actual rules for giving and receiving feedback. And so before I get into this uh, second assignment that I, I mentioned, uh, I wanted to uh, talk about these rules. So um, how to give feedback. Well, the first rule is create safety. And by that, I mean that you don't want to put your project out for um, comment on Reddit or Facebook or any of the places on the internet where anonymous trolls can come by and say mean things. That's just asking for heartbreak. Uh, I don't know why trolls do what they do, but you cannot control them. You cannot make them behave. Uh, all you can do is, is, is just try to, to stay on a, a different path. So you wanna seek feedback from an area or a zone that you know people have your best interest at heart. When you go out of the murking world, then the workplace, your colleagues at work are that zone. Here at college, your classmates, are, our discussion boards are that zone. We know that your classmates have your best uh, uh, interests at heart. No one's gonna be acting uh, irresponsibly or, or meanly. You know, it's, it's our jobs as instructors to make sure that all the other students are treating, treating, treating each other with respect. So, the discussion board becomes an area where you can kind of expose yourself and realize that you can be a little bit vulnerable because everyone there is in the same position and they all have your interests at heart. So if you're looking for feedback in the right place, then the next rule is to be positive. Now that doesn't mean that you only say nice things. It means that you need to talk about the things that can be changed. And for every project, this is gonna be different. Some projects have briefs on them, assignments. This assignment that I gave you was, you have to talk to a dream employer. So that's built into the assignment. That can't be changed. Someone says you shouldn't talk to a dream employer, that would not be good feedback because that's part of what you need to be doing. But po be positive, talk about things that can change. People can change their voiceover. People can change the language that they use. They can change the examples. They can change the artwork. They can change slides. They can change the tempo. Uh, you know, so you want to talk about the things that can be changed. You want to be specific. That's very important. For instance, um, you may see someone's slides and say, 
I don't like your fonts. That's not good feedback. It's not good feedback because you don't like their fonts. It's fine not to like their fonts. But if you only say that, then they don't know what to do. They only know that their fonts don't please you, but they don't know how to change them. So when I say be specific, when you have an objection or you have a comment, give someone some options, give someone some suggestions of what they should do. Instead of saying, I don't like your font, you should say something like, I think your fonts are too thin. Uh, they're very hard to read from far away. You should use a thicker font or you should maybe use this particular typeface. Then you're offering suggestions. And that means the person who's receiving that feedback can consider it. They can imagine what it would be like to thicken the font or change the typeface and they can choose to do that or not. But if you're not specific, they don't know how to change that font. Or, you know, if you say, I don't like that color, they don't know what to change the color to. If you say, I don't think that color works in this context, using green would give you more contrast, then you've given a suggestion that's specific and that's actionable. So these two in combination, be positive, be specific, mean tell people things that they can actually do. Uh, and that's the helpful uh, feedback that they're really looking for in that moment. Be immediate. All right, when we're all on deadline, we all have to get this project finished by Sunday. But I'm not going to be um, uh, telling you any new information when I say that probably most of you in the chosen fields you've gone into, you're going to be on deadline for the rest of your life. Whatever project you're working on, I guarantee you it's got a deadline. It's probably not uh, really long. It's probably fairly soon. So when someone asks for feedback, and you cannot give them the feedback in that particular moment, you should look for their, you should ask them for their time frame. Because the only thing worse than getting bad feedback is getting good feedback after it's too late. And most people, when they're looking for feedback, they're on deadline. So you need to, if you cannot participate in that immediate request at that moment, Ask what the time frames are so that you can get back. And in this case, I'm asking you guys to post up your uh, projects that you turned in Sunday night uh, on the uh, discussion board today or tomorrow so that they're up there so people have a chance to look at them. And those people that give you feedback should, should give you feedback by Thursday or Friday so that by the weekend you can come back and you can see what the feedback is and you can evaluate it and make a choice and you could add it to your project or not. But uh, I guarantee you, if you give someone really great feedback at 1130 on Sunday night, they're just gonna cry because it'll be too late for them to add it into their project. So be immediate. And finally, provide tough love. You know, sometimes somebody is really way off, they just haven't understood the project or they've gone in the absolutely the wrong direction. You're not doing them any favors by lying to them they're eventually gonna find out the truth. And it's better to hear it from a friend. You as a friend can phrase it better than someone mean. And the earlier you tell them, the more time they have to correct it and go forward. So when someone uh, has a, shows you a project and you think that they're very much off the mark, let them know as nicely as you can, as soon as you can, so that they have a chance to go to get in and make corrections and get on the right track. We're all trying to help each other. So providing tough love, sometimes it's not easy, it doesn't feel fun, but it's something that has to be done. It's like ripping off a Band-Aid in order to get the air in on, on the wound. Now, how to receive feedback, the rules for that. And the first rule for how to receive feedback is cultivate a growth mindset. Now, what do I mean by that? I mean that when you ask for feedback, you have to really want feedback. Sometimes people just want compliments. And oftentimes when people go into a, a, a show, a, a setup where they're, they're showing off their work, before they let anybody see it, they go into a long list of things that are wrong with it before you even let them see it. And that's by way of sort of arming yourself against uh, the criticism. 
You should never do that. Whenever you're going into asking someone for feedback, don't give them any preconditions. Don't say anything up ahead of time. Oftentimes, the things that you're most worried about, they won't even notice or they won't even comment on. But if you're telling them a lot of things that are wrong ahead of time, um, you're not really giving them a chance to, to give you a fresh opinion. But mostly, uh, what will happen when people start to give you feedback is that you, you're going to be, uh, there's going to be a reason why they're saying what they're saying. And you're going to want to jump in and defend yourself. Like someone will say, well, your voice sounds a little crackly there. And you're going to jump in and say, oh, yeah, I know. It's not my fault. That was the microphone. I had this really stupid microphone, blah, 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 blah. Well, it may be true. And there may be a mitigating factor on whatever the, the uh, feedback that you're getting is. But if you cut off someone who's giving you feedback, what they're going to actually hear is, I don't value your opinion. If someone is going to be kind enough to give you feedback, it's on you to let them speak their mind fully and clearly and don't interrupt them. There may be a, a, you know, a mitigating factor that you want to let them know about, and you can certainly do that after they stop talking. But if you ever cut someone off and giving you feedback you know, in order to defend yourself or, or, or talk about an excuse, they'll never give you feedback again because they'll think you're just looking for compliments. You're not really looking for feedback. You have to give other people the courtesy of saying their, their thoughts completely before you step in and talk. And uh, that's what we mean by a growth mindset. You know, you may be wanting to, you know, you'd be biting at the lip to talk about the, the bad microphone. Let the person get their thought out first because you're supposedly listening to them. You need to listen to everything they have to say and you have to be, be appreciative that they're giving you their time. Take credit for your mistakes. So if someone finds something that you did and, you know, there's no, there's no way around it. You did that and you, you know it's wrong, then uh, that's a point at which you guys can actually bond. You're actually telling the person that you're, that's giving you feedback, we're seeing this from the same point of view. And that actually makes the other things that they have to say much stronger. So take credit for your mistakes. Focus on self-improvement. So in the same way that you may have mentioned a half a dozen things before you actually let me see your project, and I would have never have noticed most of them if you hadn't said them ahead of time, lots of times people are going to give you feedback and they're going to mention a half a dozen things that you don't think are relevant. Now, listen to what they have to say. They may be relevant. But you may still listen to what they have to say and realize, well, I don't, I don't care what type of dog this is or whether the car is blue or not, etc. People focus on things that matter to them and you need to focus on self-improvement, which means that as you're listening to people give you feedback, you're gonna pick and choose and you're gonna say, this is helpful to me, this is interesting information, but I don't need to deal with this. And so you do not have to validate or, or, uh, or comment on any single piece of feedback that you receive. If people tell you that they, you know, that you should make the car green and it really doesn't matter one way or the other, you don't have to deal with that. It's information that you've got, you received it, you can, you can consider it and move on. That's what your job is in receiving feedback, is determining its relevancy. If it's not relevant to you, uh, you don't have to uh, do anything. You don't have to tell the other person that you don't think it's relevant. That's not uh, very nice either. But pick and choose from the feedback the things that matter to you. Learn from criticism. Sometimes you're not going to just resolve it. You know, this person likes blue, you like brown. The world goes on. It's information that you can take in and know about choices that are out there and know that, you know, uh, not everybody's the same. We all know that going in. Finally, find lessons and inspiration in the success of others. We all want everyone else to succeed. We all want to be able to uh, feel good about the people around us. And we want to learn from them. We want to steal from them. We want to take some of their ideas and make them our own. And, and that's all part of working together and being a team. So these are the aspects of feedback that matter. And you need to come to it with 
an open mind and a full heart and get along with the folks that you're talking about. So to that end, our 4.3 presentation feedback is uh, um, an assignment that basically uh, gives you three different student projects that are good. They're good student projects. Uh, they come from actual students and uh, they are good, but they're not perfect. So the actual uh, presentations themselves are on YouTube. We've contacted the students and gotten their permission and you have to go to the instructions PDF. The, the links for uh, the feedbacks are not there. I think I might post them in an announcement tomorrow. So, uh, you know, if you don't remember to post to, to pull down the PDF, look in the announcements and, and I'll have the links there as well. But if you open the instructions PDF and it tells you about the project, you'll see here on page two that we have three links on uh, uh, um, My name is Louis YouTube. Soto. And at the age of 15, I began wanting to follow my... Each one of these takes us to a different YouTube I presentation. Authentic. So you'll get to see three different types of presentations. And I want you to talk about one of them. So it, this is a lot like the week one TED Talk assignment. TED Talk, we wanted you to, to pick three and write about them. Here, you have three choices, but I only want you to pick one. You're only gonna pick one of these three. And for that, we want you to talk about what you like, what you didn't like, and we want you to give actionable feedback, good, useful feedback to the student about how they could improve the project. So when you pick the one that you wanna talk about, say what you like, and say what you didn't like, and then say how they could make it better. Either they should redo their voiceover, talk a different way, they could add slides, they could change, you know, add different more information, take edit stuff out, whatever you think they should do, I want you to give them that advice. So this is a short written document. I want you to just write one or two paragraphs about this project and say what it is that you like or didn't like. And there's some prompts here, you know, uh, in the instructions say what you liked, what part was uh, difficult, uh, what advice do you have for them, etc. And from last week, the three pillars of presentation, we have a little, little thing here. Are they appealing to ethos, pathos, or logos? So just mention that in there. So I want you to write one or two paragraphs about this, the project. You know, it's just a text file. You don't have to add any uh, extra media or, or images or anything like that. You can write it in the feedback uh, box here if you like, or just make a short text file and, and throw it up. Uh, in addition to the two paragraphs on the, on the film that you choose, I want you to give me a final third paragraph. Add a paragraph reflecting upon your thoughts about feedback. How might this process inform your critique and process and, uh, about your own work? So just give me your thoughts about what feedback is good at for you, how, how you might be um, using feedback in your own work. So uh, that's just a short document. Probably shouldn't take you more than 15 minutes or so. Turn it in. And uh, so these are the two assignments that you do this week. I want you to do, I want you to pick one of the student films, give me a short written, statement about feedback. And then I want you to turn in your final version of the project. And as I was saying earlier today, uh, the rules for the final version are that it has to be self running. And you have to give us in addition to the actual file, we want you to give us a changes list. And that changes list can be a text document. You, you, you drag and drop it in along with the film. Uh, you can also put it in the discussion board. So, I mean, in the uh, feedback box. So if you wanna put your changes list here as you, as you upload your uh, final project, that'll be fine. 
Uh, you can also um, uh, put it in as a separate document and upload it. And uh, while it's not a, a requirement that you turn your final presentation into a movie, that's the best way to ensure that it's self-running. And if you make it a movie, another thing that we suggest, again, not required, but we suggest, is that you post it to YouTube. Uh, this is just a good habit to get into. You'll be archiving your work from class to class, and you don't have to actually make this visible to the world. You can, you're given free online space from Google uh, if you join uh, and, and have a, a YouTube space. But what happens is if you make this a movie, sometimes the movies are kind of big. They're 300 megabytes or 600 megabytes. It's a lot of data to move back and forth. But if you're storing it on YouTube and you want to share it with somebody in an instant, all you have to do is send somebody a link. And nowadays when you're wanting to communicate with people really fast and you're talking, you're, you're, you're talking to them in text, you're talking to them on a phone, uh, being able to send them a YouTube link that they can watch immediately rather than a 600 megabyte file, incredibly useful. So uh, I suggest it, it's not required, but if you do put your work on YouTube, then uh, instead of turning in the file, uh, a 600 megabyte file that you drop on here, all you have to do is give me the YouTube link and I'll watch it there. So uh, again, that becomes uh, either a text file or something that you drop in the feedback, but a YouTube link is not the same as a large movie file. But the, uh, whatever, whatever you do for the self-running final version needs to be done by Sunday night. Anybody that needs more time, just get a hold of me uh, and I can give you a little bit more time. Uh, we, we had a whole lot of extra time this month because of the extra week of spring break. And I would like most of us to try to get done by Sunday, but anybody who needs extra time, I know these are difficult circumstances and a lot of us have a lot of uh, different things going on. So those of you that can turn in everything you can early and give yourself some extra time. Those of you that need extra time, just let me know and I will make sure that you have that available to you. Um, what's gonna happen right after midnight on Sunday night is that your next class will open up and you'll be able to access it from uh, the uh, uh, Full Sail Connect page. So the same place, the upper left-hand corner, where you've been able to access uh, this class, after midnight on Monday, you're going to see in the upper left-hand corner, both classes listed. And you'll be able to have access to this class for about two more weeks after the class closes to see your final grades and, and those kinds of things. And you'll be able to um, access the new class. New class most of you are gonna be re uh, taking is called uh, Psychology of Play, PYP. It's a pretty cool class. It deals with uh, work and play balance and psychological processes and, and that kind of thing. And I think it's a, a, a really good companion class. A lot of people uh, really, really like it. So that class is gonna take a, a start up right after midnight on Sunday night. And this class is gonna close on Monday and, and they just go back to back like that. That's the way things are gonna work here at Full Sail. So uh, given that, for the most part, it's, it's always good to, to finish early if you can and give yourself a little breather before your new, new class starts. Uh, and the last thing I wanna mention is that we have uh, an additional thing that we ask you to, to fill out. It's not for a grade, but we, uh, we do ask you to fill it out. It's called a portfolio competency self-reflection. And basically we're asking you to, to look, to think about what you did this month and ask yourself, was it worthwhile to you? Do you think you did a good job? Was it what you were expecting, et cetera? It helps us to make the class better, and it really is a, a good uh, information for us to help make uh, the class better going forward. So we ask that you fill that out, but wait till the end because you're really sort of evaluating everything. So uh, don't really start on this until you've finished your final version of, of the uh, um, brand yourself presentation. 
All right. Do you have any questions? Uh, I have that chat box open. So anybody who doesn't want to uh, raise their hand or anything uh, um, can, can ask a question in the chat box. Anybody who does want to raise their hand, uh, just let me know and I can open your mic. Um, we, I was still seeing a few people who are having uh, trouble um, getting their audio into PowerPoint and some of the other things. And so, you know, I'm available all week. So anybody who's having that kind of trouble, get a hold of me and I'll do one-on-ones with you because it's, it's a lot easier just to talk you through it. Uh, Tamara Armstrong writes, how does a bonus work? Um, well, there really isn't bonus. Uh, any project or any assignment that you were assigned this month that you didn't get accomplished, uh, you want to try to go ahead and finish. I will accept work late. So like if, if uh, for some reason you never did 1.4, uh, I will still accept it if you get it done. But uh, we do not have other makeup work to offset bad grades. We just allow you to um, get work that you didn't get done turned in. And if you did a project and you did it poorly and you want to resubmit it, we can allow you to do that as well. So if you've got a grade that you didn't like and you want to turn in another version of a, of a project, uh, I'll allow that up until Sunday night, but uh, we don't want the class to extend on forever. So uh, basic answer tomorrow is that we don't have bonus work, but we allow people to, to get previous assignments in after the bell. Any other questions? All right, if not, I'm gonna let you go, guys go. Um, I'm sorry this is gonna kind of uh, odd extended class. I think that that extra month, extra week of uh, spring break, uh, rather than make the class zip by, it made it kind of feel disconnected. And uh, But uh, I'm, I'm not seeing that reflected in the presentations. Uh, I think most of the presentations I was seeing were really on point and well done. So I think you guys are pretty smart and I think you're gonna have good careers here at Full Sail. And I wish you guys the best. So uh, with that, I'm gonna let you guys go. Anybody that um, you know needs help, Get a hold of me and uh, we'll have plenty of help through the week. Good night.